Yo, honestly, I don't care what anyone says. That was one of the best commercials. That, roll that beautiful <laughs> beat footage. <laughs> like, yo, we made the secret. And the dog's not talking. And this nigga would be like, roll that beautiful beat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I don't care. It was. And we are on, you guys. We're talking about that commercial because I said that at the beginning. It's Extra Connections. I'm James Lott Jr. Um, this person that I'm talking to right now, I just admire him so much. And, you know, I'm an, I'm an older person. And I always look to the younger generation. I'm looking for ones that are actually affecting positive change in the world who are doing some stuff. And this person is doing it. I mean, comedian, host, producer. He comes from an interesting racial and ethnic background like I do. Um, and I hate to use the word unique because it's like, it's like a basic word. But he is somebody who stands out to me as always has. He's simply Tehran. Hi, Tehran. You you have to be special to just have one name. Yes, you know it, what I'm saying? Like it, Cher, yes, Madonna, Sade, yeah, 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 uh, Jesus. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be special. You gotta be I, special to have one name. Like you said, I am Tehran. You are Tehran. That's I right. I really am Tehran. James Lott. That's just one name. It is. That's just one name. I've never heard someone just call you James. They don't. James Lott. James Lott. It's either James Lott, James Lott Jr., or JLJ. I've never, I've never exactly. Called, I've never, never. called. Has anyone ever called you Jimmy? Has anyone ever tried to be like, hey, Jimmy? My father is Jim. Sure. So they try. By choice, but by choice. Your yeah, father is Jim by saying, choice. By choice. But I'm saying, so when I'm around his people back in the day, they go, oh, hi, Jimmy. No, my name is James. What happens with James is, like with some people's names, they automatically give you a nickname. And I'm always like, we're not familiar yet for you to give me a nickname. And I don't know if that's my nickname. You don't know that either. So it's like, hey, Jimmy. Hey, Jimbo. I'm called Jimbo. Hey, Jimbo. No, my name is I just call you, I, I call you Zaddy. So I don't really, I don't know what everyone else is calling you. You know what I'm saying? But that's just, you know, <laughs> earned it, you know. Thank you. Like, mm -hmm. Earned it. Like, what, do I, what are we doing? That's so you funny. Know? So yeah, no, you're right. I, people will try to nickname me. So when you, when you say your name, they go, well, isn't that a place you people live? Or like, do they do anything? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. People try to give me a nickname. They try to T, 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 T. Yo, it's Tehran. My name's Tehran. Uh, it's the capital of Iran. And it also happens to be my name. A lot of people find that extraordinary or unbelievable, especially if they're Persian, because no other Persian has the name Tehran. In fact, because of my name, there's an actual legal precedent that no one else was allowed to be named Tehran until recent history. And now people are naming their children Tehran in Iran after me specifically, which is a very interesting thing. Because uh, in Iran, a lot of people felt that it might be revolutionary considering my background and my family's background from Iran. So my interesting heritage, as people like to put it, I'm half Iranian on my father's side, and then I'm half black on my mother's side, and people always assume that my father will be black and my mother will be yes, Iranian. Of course, because of course. That seems to be the normal trope yeah, for people is, of course. is that black men go outside of their race to yeah. date other women, which is another problematic conversation on its own. So my father's the Iranian one and my mother's black, so you know it's real. All right, okay, wait, so how did they hook up? It's a lot of people think my dad's like Martin Luther King or something. It's like this was for social justice. No, uh, my dad's very traditionally Iranian. He just happened to meet my mother in college, you know, oh, and, okay. and in college, and you know, he needed green card, she needed credit card, and they got married. No, they just you know met in college and fell in love. That's just how it works, or at least fell in hate. You know how marriage when marriage lasts long enough, it's real. But that. That's like when, when you have so much love for someone, it's like, I, I want to kill you, but no one else is ever allowed to kill you. I oh, well, yeah, of course. No one else oh, yeah. Oh, that yeah. ever thinks about killing you. I've earned it. So, oh, yeah. Oh, no, know, I talk shit. That My love. family, we can talk shit about each other, but someone else talks shit about us, and then, then all of a sudden, 100%. it's a double yeah. standard. But and it's true. then they, James Lott, yeah. yeah. You don't, you don't mess with that. I mean, don't please. I mean, I'm, that's my brother. He gets to my goddamn nerves. Yeah, I'm going to go off on him. But no, you go off on him for no reason. Then I'm going to jump in on, you know, we don't. Exactly. Know. Even if you do have a reason, you don't talk to him like that. You know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know. I, you know, Tehran, I was, one of those, I was one of those people like, I'm ready. What's, what, what's going on? What are we doing? What are we doing? What's going on? I, I, was, I know. I, was I know. You've done that for me a couple I, times. I'm I like, have. no, no, no. <laughs> This is I'm just like, a I'm conversation. Ready. We're just talking. I'm like, yeah. I'm what's up? What's up? I'm like, he's smart. Yeah. We're talking to him. 
But because you know, because I did, I instantly liked you. It was funny. So, folks, when I first saw him around <laughs> the studio, I have to laugh. He always came in in a robe. Yeah, a bathrobe, a black robe, and he always did his shows in a robe. But I'd watch his shows, and it was like, and here's this guy who's super intelligent, very engaging, good host, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he's wearing a robe, so I thought that's kind of cool. That's his like thing. And I remember you'd always say hi to me. We always said hi to each other, even before we started really talking. And then we met. I asked you about it. You told me a little story. But that's what I'm saying. You stand out. You always seem like like you're like me. We are our own people. We just we are just you are Tehran. I'm James. Like I'm just we just are who we are. Have you always exactly. been that way? Have you always been that way? Unfortunately, yes. I never learned the lesson that so many people do, which is blend in, or that lesson of try to accommodate or make others feel comfortable. I never learned that lesson. And while it's unfortunate for others, it's always been extremely fortunate for myself because at, at, at the end of the day, to use that cliche, whether I succeed or fail, I'll know it's because of my own merit or flaws. I know that it's never because of the false foot that I've placed forward and that's what, that's what caused my downfall. Uh, and we see so many people in that light we see so many people putting that fake foot forward and then getting called out on their hypocrisy and having no answer that's why nobody's going after gucci man you understand what i'm saying that's why nobody's going after no one's going after hove in that way uh people uh, until he changed up until he changed gotcha. up in the beginning nobody went after hove because he presented himself in the way that he always wanted to or at least who he seemed to be so uh we see that is uh, problematic for people like Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart comes off as this person, this lovable, affable family person. And then when he gets caught cheating, which is obviously a horrible thing, yes. but it's made more horrible based on the false light, which he seemed to have presented himself. Now, that was us taking it in. That was us creating an expectation of this person who's a flawed human being who handled the misgivings extremely well, in my opinion, uh, yeah. making it up to his family and all that. But it's just because we create these false expectations of people in the public. So I never create false expectations. Anyone who knows me knows I'm the same person from the time you meet me till the time you greet me to the time you let me go. I'm the same person. I know, I, I can touch why you are. You are very much the same person. I appreciate that. I think my always thing is, you know, Take it or leave it, like it, don't like it. It's all up to you. I, but you can never say that James isn't being James. Like he's That's not being- That's what I like. That's why I liked you from the get. You know when, and, it, and for, let's be very, you're a very likable person. You're a likable person. I'm not, first of all, I don't like just anybody. And I'm not an easily liked person. Like people either like me, they either love me or they hate me. I'm, I've always been a polarizing entity since I was a child. Since I was a child, I've been very similar. So that's why I always liked you because you are you, no matter what. You always tell me your opinion to my face. You always are straight up. And it, whether you agree or disagree with something I said possibly, for example, if we have a conversation, you have the ability to differentiate between an argument and a person. Yes. And that's what I love about you. It's like, you're not just taken, I've seen you. You and I don't really disagree on many topics, no, however, no. I've seen you, um, surprisingly, people would think we would, but we really don't. But we actually seen, don't, I know, it's, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly, because well, I've seen you have conversations with people and they're getting really upset and you're not upset at the person, you just don't like the idea which they place forth and that's it. They place an idea forth, you're not uh, in agreement with it and you're, you separate it. You don't get upset, you never get mad, you're not raising your voice, they're getting all upset and and argumentative and you're like yo it's just a, it's a conversation hello folks I, I do and that's thank you and that part of that is getting older to just kind of not caring as much and also learning how to discern and maybe it's my life coaching training maybe it's my nurses training or whatever whatever it is i just i've learned how to discern between um arguments and fights conversations disagreements debates um they're all and they're all real you can have them i had a, i did a show with my friend is a republican my friend dr christopher metzler love him to death uh we actually agree on a lot of the same stuff actually we're just different sides kind of um we always have conversations with people like how can you be a friends with a republican i go yeah we disagree on some major things we teach each other about it 
But there are a lot of things we do agree on. There's a lot of sameness out there that I think people forget about across the board, whether it's gay, straight, across black, the board. white. A lot, of, a lot of sameness that people aren't willing to sit and listen. I always ask people, are you an active listener? Do you know how to listen? And that means that's just not with your ears, with your eyes, with everything. You have to, there's a whole art to that, right? And you know, I mean, you do it, you know how to do it. So I mean, it's like just about hearing what people are saying, watching their body language, and, and just kind of seeing the world at large. There's a lot of things that we are a lot of the same. And if people really get to that core of that, we might do better. I think we might do better if we notice that. Don't just go by outward appearance and go, well, Tehran's this way and Jayla Jr.'s this way. They can't be friends. They, they can't get along. Like, what's the, you know, the, the numbers would look like they can't get along. No, not at all. We actually get along very well. And there's something about that, that most of us probably would get along really well if we acted differently. Um, if we learn how to listen, which is a skill actually a lot of comedians have. Oh, uh, the yeah. Better, oh, yeah. The best comedians are extremely good listeners. We pay attention, which is actually why we're able to come up with witty responses to things or call back to things which you didn't even realize we paid attention to or we noticed or we simply were able to receive from you, whether you verbalized it uh, vocally or simply in your expressions, we pay a lot of attention, which is even why when we're in the studio and we're being funny, I will make reference to something that someone doesn't even realize I paid attention to them saying, whether it's an hour ago, a minute ago, or a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, and I'll bring it back and it's just fun. And that's the concept of great comedy. Okay, how, wait, so how do you primarily, what lens do you see the world through? Comedian, race, male i mean what do you what do you think you primarily see the world through that's that's actually the lens of a comedian is that i cannot differentiate between the lenses in which i see the world i see the world as a persian person as a black person as an american as a foreigner as a male as a person who's acclimated to females as a person of color but even as a person who is understanding of people who don't have color. I can see why white people feel the way they do. I don't agree with their opinion, but I can understand their opinion. That's one of the things of being mixed, which I feel gives a perspective or a worldly advantage, especially if you're mixed with someone who is not American. You see the world in a very different light because unfortunately a lot of Americans do not travel outside of America. They don't realize that there's a whole world out there. There's actually a very interesting, uh, of course, meme, which is our, our modern day cliff notes to the yeah, world. Yes. There's a meme that shows uh, an American's point of view of what the world looks like. And it's just these circles like important, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. war, you right. know, it's just like, uh, who are they again? It's just like, it's like these circles. It's very interesting. It's very funny. But that's what comedy does. Comedy gives a perspective of its own. So if you look about, if you look at the last decade or two decades in history, comedians are really just the philosophers of the world. Look at politics. Politics is every, everyone's a political aficionado now. Everyone knows everything about politics. But the people we look for, for our political views and commentary People like Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah, John Stewart, uh, Samantha B, Larry Wilmore, uh, all these people, John Oliver, they're just comedians. Bill Maher is just a comedian. Yes. Wanda yes. Sykes is just a comedian. Yeah. Like, that's all she is, is a comedian. She never studied politics. She never, she, she doesn't have a master's in the subject. However, Dave Chappelle's point of view is one that's so poignant on race in politics that we pay attention and they can vocalize like a great song our, our opinions into a one minute two minute bit with a punchline that makes us laugh because if we weren't laughing we'd be crying which is why when you watch the news you get so mad but when you watch comedy specials you walk out glad well they're telling you the exact same story That's it's just true. the way we deliver it i have i've had a lot of comedians on my shows and we have a lot of comedian friends in common and I remember uh, one of my comedian friends, uh, Tay Marcatan, who I love, just love to pieces. He's hilarious. He was, he's, 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 he's very smart and hilarious. Like, just yes. really funny. I've had, had him several times on my show, and he just got married recently. Congratulations to him. Um, but he talks about the tension and release we need. And that's what comedy provides. It's all this tension, 
we got to release it somehow, or else we'll kill everybody. We'll just kill each other. So comedy, and, is dead. we see right? happening. Yeah. yeah, which we see, which we see, right, which we see happening. But comedy is a form and a way that you, basically, what you just said, that can help release that kind of tension a little bit. Go, ooh, okay, we can kind of laugh about this right now. It's not really funny, but it is kind of funny. Like it's kind of like you can kind of do that. I think, I think comedy is so important. I think it's so important especially these days, because we need it. I mean, yes, the world is serious. Trust me, I know how serious the world can be. I live it every day. But there's times I want to be silly. I want to laugh. I want to laugh at a smart joke. I want to laugh at something. the best jokes. Those are the best jokes. Right. Good comedy makes you laugh. Great comedy makes you think. Ha, 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 that's good. But you know what the best response is? That's so true. That's the best comedy. Those are the, those are the comedy routines that you remember forever. Whether it's things that... Cr- Chris Rock has said, or Dave Chappelle's uh, racial conflict jokes. Those are things that just stick out in your mind. You can like a comedian who's, who's goofy and silly, but you can't repeat a single line that Chris Farley has ever said, even though you know that you liked him, he was a loved comedian. But you can repeat word for word things that, things that on the sites, exactly, Chris yeah. Rock, exactly, Amanda Seals. You can repeat things that they've said because they were poignant in their, in their punchline. And that's what makes it spectacular. I watched um, the Joan Rivers documentary. Talk about a legend, obviously, in the business. Man or male or female, just a legend in the business. And she had, did a comedy routine about, <laughs> I guess, about getting screwed by a man with no leg or whatever. And someone in the audience confronted her afterwards and said, well, my husband lost his leg. Wow, how can you say that? And Joan was such a fascinating, she went back at her and said, my father had no leg. Like, I grew up with somebody who had no leg. I'm not uh, going after you. I mean, she did this whole thing that made me understand comedy a little better. Just said, like, she went, I'm just trying to lighten things up a little bit and make it a little funny and take something that was tragic in my family and turn it on its ear. And she told clever jokes about it. Like, it was a whole, but jokes that have layers. They're like, they have layers. It was like, but watching her talk about that and how, there's just this, this need to not be so literal all the time. And also, but it's kind of like, I like we, we do need that sometimes. And we, Dave Chappelle, especially his show, just like, I mean, the, the, some of the jokes seem silly, but when you, I'm still thinking about them years later, I'm going, wow, that I mean, is like. We all think about the, the you know, Clayton Bixby, the, like the, yes. the black KKK member. That's Jesus. something that still Jesus. we think about. Exactly. Jesus. The, the punchline is Exactly. Exactly. We still think about these things. And, and you realize this is 20 years removed. This is something which is 20 years and only two seasons removed. And it's stuck out in our minds so much that we still talk about it to this day. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing an after show on my network for the Girlfriend Show, which was back in the 2000s. And I'm rewatching it. And it's coming on Netflix on September 11th. So that's kind of nice. Um, and I'm seeing, wait, this show is actually groundbreaking for black women. 100%. Like, I didn't even realize, I watched it when it originally came out, and I loved it, but now looking at it 20 years later, 20 years older, uh, looking at it going, wait a minute, even the girls having different hairstyles was revolutionary. The girls talking about sex openly, black women, talking about sex. I'm just, I've seen the show in a whole new light, um, and I'm just thinking, Wow, we did, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of things that I'm starting to open myself. It's a comedy. It's literally a comedy, which has some drama in it. But again, they're showcasing stuff that 20 years ago, we were still afraid to talk about. We're still talking about today. I always tell people, I said, it's just so weird for me because I mean, I'm 51 years old. I mean, I have no problem sharing my age. I am. Black don't crack. You look amazing. Let's be honest. You look amazing. <laughs> I, it would be, if you were, if you were James Lott Jr., the white guy, <laughs> you'd be like, yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, I'm 51 years old. We'd be like, yes, we know. <laughs> no, I think I think my mother been eating for all her genes. Um, but no, I really, I it's I, I'm 51 years old, and there are a lot of things that came up this year for me that I remember talking about 30, 40 years ago. Like literally, I'm like, I'm tired. There's a lot of things that I'm just as my generation. I'm just tired because I was marching and doing stuff 30 years ago, 25 years ago, and we're still talking about it. But you said something earlier that I want to expand on that I agree with you on. I understand why white folks feel the way they do a lot of times. I totally get it. And I, and I, can, I can understand it, may not like it, but I can understand it because I have white members in my family. I have white folks in my family. I grew up multiracial. I have that in my family. So I get where they're coming from as well as getting where we come from, you know, as people of color and as, you know, as, from other places. 
So I, I guess my outlook is people of color should come together more, uh, not rely on them so much, like come together more. So what are your feelings on the village and people trying to uplift each other in their own race? No, actually, a lot of people think, oh, black people should come together more. And, you know, that's not, that's not correct. Okay. Black people should come together, period. Like, oh, okay. there shouldn't even be a more. This is, this, is, this is the realest thing. First of all, you see this white opinion and people get so, how can you not see it? Well, you know, have you, have you ever used scissors, James? Of course. Have you, are you right-handed? Are you right-handed? I'm left-handed. Left You're left-handed. So this is, this is why I brought this up, because this is what I remembered about you. When a right-handed person hands you a pair of scissors and it's like, hey, can you cut this for me? Why, why do you get upset? Because it's right-handed pair of scissors. Do you know how hard it is to use a right-handed pair of scissors for a person who's left-handed? Do you know how hard it is to do a lot of things in this world that are mostly created for right-handed people for someone who's left-handed like yourself? But guess what? Right-handed people never even think about it because it's something that does not affect them. It's not an affliction that they have to deal with. So they never even think about how difficult it is for a left-handed person to ever have to use a pair of scissors, which majority of scissors, 99% of scissors are created for right-handed people. In fact, you have to go out and purchase specifically a left-handed pair of scissors. Have some. Yeah, have some, yeah. So when you use, use right-handed scissors, what happens? Your hand hurts, it gets crooked, everything, and then you get blamed for it. Well, that's the exact same thing that happens with race because white people do not have to deal with something. They may not be aware that it's actually a problem. They may not be aware of systemic racism. In fact, many of them are not specifically racist. What they are is unaware. That what they are is misinformed. What they are is uneducated. What they are is they're just unable to see a perspective that's different than their own. And before we go blaming a whole group, remember we do that almost every day, but because it's something we think is minute or small, we don't care about it either. Which is why when you ask me, do I have a man or a male perspective on comedy? I do, but I, I am man enough to listen to a woman. And that's where you have to be aware. I, I'm right-handed enough to listen to someone who's left-handed and be aware that they're left-handed and, and notice and understand the difference. And even though that I may not be able to exactly sympathize, I can 100% empathize with their situation. And that's what we need to realize in race. If white people weren't afraid, if they didn't understand, yeah, why, why do you think they're so afraid of becoming minorities in 2050 or whatever? They'll be like, we're gonna be the minority. Is it possibly because subconsciously they realize that there's a history of disenfranchising and oppressing minorities in this country? Of course, which is why they're so afraid of it. They're afraid of losing their piece of the pie, not realizing that we're not taking away from their slice of cake. We all just want a slice of cake as well. And it's not so much about just equality. It's also about equity. And it's about attaining that equity in this country. So that's why black people need to come together because to be very honest, we're both wrong. We're all wrong. They just happen to be more wrong than us because they don't understand the problem to begin with. And while we understand the problem, now it is more up to us to solve it. And when we realize that it's not being given, we need to realize we need to give it to ourselves. No one's asking for a handout. We're simply asking for a hand up just to be where we su we're supposed to be. That's it. Once that hand up is not coming, then we need to realize that our own hands work just as well, if not better, to push each other. Let's get rid of this crab in a barrel mentality and stick together the same way we get so upset when other communities do so. I I'm part Jewish. And I noticed that there's a lot of animosity towards the Jewish community in the black community in certain places. Well, guess what? The Jewish community is simply doing what the black community should have been doing since day one and even more and would have so much more power because we are the trend in the United States and therefore the world. We are the culture in the United States and therefore the world. We are the music. We, you know, if black people didn't exist, how boring this world would be. Do you know how boring fashion would be? Do you understand this? So we are clearly very much a part of this 
part of this world. Now we have to see ourselves. We need to get rid of this imposter syndrome we have and think that, you know, we're not good enough. We need to realize that we are great enough to do these things on our own. We do not need to wait for permission. We can do these things on our own. We can create another Black Wall Street. We can have another Seneca uh, Village. We can have another uh, Bruce Beach. We can do all these things on our own. With NFL, you're not, you're not listening to us? That's okay. You know what? I'm sure we can find grass and throw a football on our own. Oh, Oscars, you don't want to give us awards? That's okay. From now on, we only like the Jamals. We only accept Jamals. I don't even want an Oscar. I want a Jamal. You know, we can do that. We can okay. always do these things. Yeah, my, um, you just, you know, well, you know, if I couldn't love you more, you just maybe love you more. Everything you said, I completely agree with. Um, and I have a friend, Anthony Anderson, who started an award show because of that, because the Emmys weren't supporting black and brown talent. He started his own show. He, put, he put his own, I mean, a nice, beautiful show in Washington, D.C. last year um, with a red carpet and press. And he did it himself. And he did He said, your shows have to be 70% or more black. No, white folks can come to you. But, but you have to, your shows have to have 70% representation of black people. And it was kind of like, we're not trying to exclude white folks. We're trying to include black folks. That's the whole point. And give them a place to showcase their work. Just to show, who cares? We were all, it was so funny, we were all there, and I won an award, I lucked out. But we all went there, not because we wanted to win so hard, it's just kind of like, I see all these brown faces. I get to meet so much great talent I had no idea about. None. Exactly, and it was exactly. Like, that's the point, so when you say that, I go, I agree. It's like, but he created this thing, now he's gonna do another, another one. It's like, that's the point. It's like, we kind of have to figure out ways to, work with each other and just kind of like, and just, you know, and, and not look at each other's competition. Get rid of the generational trauma. We have to break down the generational trauma. We have to like, I, I get it. Your parents told you this and your parents, I mean, I mean, my parents told me um, that I wouldn't get ahead unless I did twice as much work. So that's what I was taught. You, know, you got to change, got to do twice as much to get half as much. That's what I was told. I had to teach myself that's kind of true, but not true. Actually, I, it, it is true. It's true. But, but I, but, but you have to just do the twice as much work. Like, it's true, but I'm not going to think of it like that. This is how much work is for me. It's not a comparison. I'll do it. But you know what? When I do it, then the next generation doesn't have to. Yes. So just, you just said what I was going to say. So basically, that's what it is. I, I, had to sw I had to flip the mindset switch and go, okay, thank you for that, parents. You were being real at that, at that time period. I mean, I came up in the 80s. That was, that was true life. I always tell people, I was born during civil rights in the 60s. I was party segregation in the 70s. Didn't work. Didn't work. Um, I, I was fired for being black from several jobs in the 80s. I had to fight to get to the table at jobs in the 90s. So I know what it's like. And I just kept saying my attitude was always, I'm James Lott Jr. I'm going to make it through however I'm going to make it through. And I can do more than just get half as much. I can actually achieve the possibilities I can't achieve. And I think that's what I have to teach these younger people. And I'm seeing it, though. I'm seeing it. I'm starting to see it where they're like, I can do more than this. I can get more than this. And I feel like when I look at people like you people, and people younger than you also, I'm a little more happy now because I'm kind of like, okay, this last round of Black Lives Matter made me smile because I saw true change in people's mindsets. That's what I was looking for. I'm like, I want to see, because I don't want to see protesting and then two weeks later we're back to, you know, eating Popeye's chicken sandwiches. I want people to actually continue this and make real change. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. People are, getting to are being done of being just being tolerated. They're done of being just you know, placated, no more of the racial gaslighting. People are just like, we are just like, that is it, bitches. We are done. And I love that attitude. I just think it's, it's something that we have to, we have to break the cycle. We have to, especially as black people, we got to break the cycle. Other races, Asian, Latino races, they stick together. They pull each other up. They lift each other up. And that's what I try to do in everything that I do. I know shame, Sam. I'll, I'll get a black person first on the show before anybody else. I have no problem. I have white friends and I have people, I'll, I'll do it too. And I support my friends. But if someone says, I need help, James, can I be on your show? Can you do this? And they're of color. I'm more apt to help them first and not apologize for it, Tehran. I'm done apologizing for supporting my own people, whether they're gay or black or whatever. We're not, I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize. No one else apologizes. Why am I apologizing? Wait, 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 wait. You're gay? <laughs> no. It's been, no. Six, it's been six months. It's been six months. It's new. It's yeah, yeah, new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID. <laughs> I'm just, I I'm asexual now at this point. I'm just like, I'm just Honestly, like, COVID has me this close to being gay myself. If someone's willing <laughs> yeah. to pay rent, if someone's willing to pay my rent, like, 
yo, I'm not gay, but my boyfriend is. You know right, exactly. I'm, like, I'm all, there's some, that, there's some chicks that look yeah. good these days. I'm like, okay, sure, why not? <laughs> it's like, yo, what up? Grandfather. Told me, right? Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. You're like, you're like, I haven't had human touch in a while. Like, hey, Julia. So <laughs> crazy. Because I'm a hugger. I'm a toucher. I and know. I, you know, you know. And that's, I'm just like, oh my God, it's this crazy talk. I mean, for the first 90 days, Tehran, I didn't see anyone. I remember you were, you were confined because you're also around a lot of people who are older and uh, you had told me they have uh, pre like pre I, I mean, and, and I'm a condition I, I, my, I'm immune compromised my Bell's palsy and all this stuff so I was like they said shut down James I shut down. I had Instacart deliveries and Amazon Fresh deliveries but I didn't go to the yeah. store none for 90 days that first and you were wiping days, boxes down wiping boxes was, down yeah. oh my brother you know, he's, making, he's, he's making so much fun of my brother's like James, how long does it take you to put away groceries? I go, as long as it takes, because I have my routine. I had a table for groceries. And I take this out here. I mean, I did everything the doctors told me to do, and I took a negative test last week, and I'm negative, so, I mean, I don't have it. Um, no, there was a time people used to want to be HIV negative. Now they're like, I'm COVID negative. See? HIV, got it, but COVID? Isn't that crazy? Whoa. I know. I, was, I went to one plague already. I already know what, I already, I don't know what that's like. Yeah, because you can take PrEP. You can take PrEP. You can't take hydroxychloroquine or whatever. Like, we don't, hydroxychloroquine, where do you even get that? No one's giving us that. What's. Hey, Ron, I heard hydrox, and I was like, like those Oreo cookies back in the 90s? I'm yeah. like, Hydrox? And I was like, no, James. And I was like, they some cookies, I'm better. No. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, it's completely, yeah. So I, I just. Hydrox cookies. That's how I know you're from the hood, bro. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I know. Oreo. No, ma no matter how much James Lott tries to act refined, he's so hood. You people do not know how hood James Lott really is. Uh, I'm drinking Ghetto Aid right now. Yeah. It's so, my teeth are sweating right now. It's so sweet. That's the best. Those, that's the best, though. Um, it, it's interesting because you, you, you said something very, very specifically profound is um, doing for ourselves. And you mentioned Anthony Anderson's award show, which I was a full supporter of. Um, it's, it's not saying we're better or we're different. It's saying we can do for ourselves and that's okay. We, and I like how you said, I'm going to help and I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to apologize. And you know, you, we all make that joke of how Asians own dry cleaners, that joke, that's such a low hanging fruit of a joke. Right. Well, the reason is, is because initial Asian came and figured out the system for dry cleaning and how it works and how it's a business that was needed in the United States. And they then, gave that plan back to other families that were trying to come here because that is what they had to do. And a lot of immigrants who do not support Black Lives Matter or the Black, uh, uh, the black people in this country, they don't even realize how much they benefit civil rights wise, civil rights wise from Black struggle, from Black struggle. So a lot of immigrants who come here and marry the American woman and become citizens is direct is a direct result of several African-American court cases that went up to the Supreme Court, not limited to and including loving. And we need to realize that. The fact that immigrants can come to this nation and become citizens, that's something that's because directly, because of the 13th Amendment, is specifically because they had to allow Black people to become citizens of this country first. And that's how immigrants were able and allowed to become citizens. A lot of people don't realize this. It's not just our struggle. It starts with Black lives. It's the front line, but it's not the end of the line. So other communities, quote unquote, stick together and are unapologetic about it. So can we, so should we. That does not mean we, we disclude. It just means we include. We include each other. And there's this competitive nature there's this competitive, competitive nature in the black community. Uh, and we see that the, the, I'm gonna do it on my own. We see it, the lack of teamwork sometimes. Uh, and it's unfortunate because teamwork does make the dream work. We can all shine as stars. We can all know, play our position and it's okay. We don't always all have to be the star for us to be in the sky. So that's something where we as black, as the black community, we need to realize that is that we can help each other 
and it doesn't take away. We're not, and, and, and that's part of the programming, by the way. That's part of that slave programming. And we saw it, and I call it the Django Manifesto, where it's like one slave can, has it all, so they make, it, make the slaves play Hunger Games. So now we inadvertently have that, have that in our mind, which is why when you listen to rap, you see rappers talk trash about other rappers. I'm the best, you're the worst, I'm the best, you're the worst, I'll take your girl. You never hear that in rock music. You never hear that in country music. You see it on the basketball court, but you never see it in golf. And golf is a, is a single player game, and yet they still don't do that. They still don't do that. You never see those anger, uh, angry conversations. And if, and if the black community talked about buying Jordan stock as much as they talk about actually buying Jordans, you know how much ahead we could and would and should be? We own Jordan. We own Jordan. We're the reason Jordan is a billion dollar man and a billion dollar company, right? We, we do. All these companies, Prada, Versace, who, who, Versace, 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 Versace. Well, maybe we need to start creating, start creating uh, black designers and remembering them and, and Dapper Dan it up where Dapper Dan has his own designs and doesn't have to use Gucci and Louis to create them for you. We, we can and should do that. Yeah, you know? I'm, you know, I'm tired of this kind of, you know, every, every decade or so, a black designer becomes big. You know, back in the 90s, we had Sean John, we had FUBU, we had all these other things, Damon John, all them. And all of a sudden, you know, we had cross colors. They were all, and everybody was wearing them for a while, but they all kind of became a joke at some point, or so it became like yes. lesser than. They went, FUBU's they, at they, Ross, FUBU's at Ross. Right, right. And it's like, but everybody went back to the white designers. It's like, it's like somehow we continue to lift them up as this standard. Now, trust me, I like me a Louis here and there and I got stuff, but I'm just like, but well, why can't we do the same for, you know, Dooney and Burke or for somebody else? So these, these people, you know, I was like, why is it always a default that it's always what's always been, so to speak? You know, back when I was a kid, it was Jordan Jeans and Sergio Valente. And I was like, but they're all white folks. It's like, why can't we have, you know, guests and all this? I'm like, why can't we have something that's ours that could be just as successful? My friend, uh, Miko Branch, who started um, Miss Jessie's Hair Care Products, uh, was saying that she was like, she was tired of seeing white folks benefit off of black folks' hair. Um, and she said her grandmother had a recipe and they were cooking in the kitchen and, they made it, and now she's a million dollar business. And that was the whole point. Her and sister started. It's like, we kind of have to do more of that. It's like, we just kind of almost get, we, we just go, okay, well, I'll go to Sally's Beauty Supply. It's not even owned by a black person at this point. It's owned, they're, they're, I guess they're franchise or whatever. And then you're buying black products from someone else, but then you're buying products that aren't even black, but for black people at some other stuff. Like, how does it all connect the dots? It doesn't. It doesn't connect the dots. It's just kind of like you're supporting, you're giving money to white folks, Asians, this, but it's not a black person in sight is getting anything out of this. Yeah, you get some good and, straight and, hair, but. And you wouldn't see that the other way around. You would never oh. see, you know, Paul Mitchell is secretly owned by Oprah. That would never happen, right? So you just wouldn't see that. Like oh. Whoopi Goldberg owns, oh. you know, Vidal oh. Sassoon. Oh. That's not something you would see and people would stop. They would literally just stop uh, purchasing those companies because we've seen that before. We've seen it before. We've saw it. We saw it with BET. We saw it with yes. Bob Johnson. Yes. Uh, we saw it when Viacom takes that company over the change of direction. We've seen it happen before. Slowly, they started moving the black products to BH1 and MTV, giving them greater popularity, the ones that were the most successful. We've seen it happen. I'll tell you something. Tehran, I'll tell you something. Growing up, watching Soul Train, yes, I watched it for the fashion, the dance, all that stuff. But knowing that the commercials were also black, Afro Sheen, Ultra Sheen, Cosmetic, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a big deal. It was seeing black models in the commercials. This was the 70s and 80s. Seeing Beverly Johnson, seeing, like, you know, seeing Jane Kennedy. I mean, seeing like, these hot ass you know, black women in commercials for black products during a show, because Dr. Needles was the bomb, during a show that was aimed towards, but then white folks watched it also. I had a lot of white friends who watched Soul Train, but it was like, but that's the point was the commercials were black. And I remember being a kid and a teenager going, this, I even knew back then this was amazing. Like to me, I knew there was something different that why wasn't it more like, like that? It's actually why I speak about representation so much. And actually it has a lot to do with my personal journey into comedy. I didn't start out a comedian. I wasn't one of those people who was like, I've all my life, I wanted to be a comedian. No, you're, you're a very that's serious. not it. Exactly. I, I actually, you know, I, I played basketball, but I was 
valedictorian. I got an undergrad degree in international politics and communications, and then a master's in economics and a law degree. A law and degree, folks, a I, law degree. And I could have went in many different directions. And I'll tell you something, I actually wanted to go into music. I wanted to be, a, I wanted to be puffy. I wanted to be a music mogul. Oh, and that was the direction I wanted to go into. Never do that. It collapsed, it collapsed. And during my law school, so I'm a grown man at this point. I, you know, I entered law school at 21 going on 22. And I was watching television as I was figuring out my life. And I saw this uh, light-skinned black comedian named Mikey Winfield. Oh, yeah. who was on Fuse Network, where he would tell jokes and then show a, a music video on Fuse of all channels. I don't even know why I had Fuse Network back then. And, and literally, I saw him do this, and I thought to myself, this is a light-skinned black guy with a fro, great smile, much better than mine, but similar features. And representation is so important that I, at 21, 22, saw someone who looked like me on television and was like, if he can do this, I can do this. And I flew to uh, LA and I met with, I, I wanted to meet him at the Laugh Factory, ended up meeting with the owner and my comedy career went from there where those were my beginning shows. The concept is I wasn't six, I wasn't eight, I wasn't 12, I wasn't 15, I wasn't 16, I wasn't 18. I was at this point, 21 years old, 22 years old. And that seeing someone who looked like me changed my life, there you go. changed my life. And that's why it's important. Yeah. That's why representation is so important because I can only imagine how more or how much more exponentially important it will be or would be for a six year old to have seen the same thing. And while we always credit people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X for civil rights, we should always also credit uh, Cosby Show, Different World, Fresh Prince, and all these other shows that acclimated Black success, not only to America and white America, but to Black America too. You know how many kids went to an HBCU because of Different World, because of a Different World? You know how many kids went to Howard or Hampton because they wanted to go to Hillman? Yeah. That's yeah. a I, real I thing. Kids Hampton. She loved Hampton. Um, my, for me, uh, Robert Townsend has been somebody that I'm trying to get on my show. I'm trying, you like some of my tweets, I haven't got my show yet. Meteor um, Man. was somebody that changed my life as a young man because when I saw Hollywood Shuffle, that was it. I saw and how brilliant and how real it was and still is in some places. Um, it got me. I was like, this guy, he gets it. And he's black, he's explaining our experience in Hollywood and what they ask you to do. I mean, it, just, it was just like, it was, it just, my brain was just blown away. You know, it was just, it was just like, this was, it was a smart comedy. And it was also some slapsticky stuff in it. And everybody used it, it was great. And I just think for me, he's one of my favorite just people. Seeing him at City Portier, just seeing his films and how, yeah, he was called the Magical Negro and all that stuff back then. I get the whole thing. But I see what he was doing. And it's very important. He had, it's, oh, the first always is the one that gets all the flack. You know that, the first of anything. They, they have to shatter the glass ceiling or whatever. That's the one who's going to get assassinated. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. For sure. For yeah. sure. So, but he is somebody that I admire so much going that, you know, you want to call him like he was the magical Negro and he was just, you know, oh, it all, see, there is a good black man, but I get what he was doing. He was playing parts that were different for white folks to see. Not for black folks to see. It was for white folks to see that we can do these other parts. He could be a noble guy. Like black folks, it was, it was so much more political when I read his story and stuff, than it was, I mean, he wanted to be an actor, that was just number one, but it was, there was some politics in there. He, he kind of had to like, I had jobs where I was the only black person in the company. And I knew I had to carry myself a certain way, not giving up who I am fully, but like I knew I had to carry myself just like, I had to talk a little different. But you also knew your work had to be almost perfect because they would say, oh, they would do the oh. And, and that's a lot of pressure. I see a lot of people like this, my my sisters are both uh, doctors, and so I know what they went through in that regards because they had to deal with it as well, you know. And there are these experiences that they tell me, which is enlightening. It's just because they know that the spotlight is on you, and there will never be, or very rarely, be a time where a white person is the only white person in the company. And yet, how many black people do you know are the only black person? in a company or on an executive board or in the boardroom or part of the marketing team or whatever it is. And, and we see that. We see it because of what happens. We see it when 
H and M doesn't understand why it's why it's problematic for a black kid to wear a monkey in the jungle. I know. Coolest monkey in the jungle shirt. Uh, because yeah. There was not a single black person or person of color who was aware who was on that team to be like, you know what? Let's change that shirt with little Charlie. Little Char- we didn't, they didn't even have to, you know, green looks better on little Charlie and orange will look better on, on his skin. Let's just uh, switch those shirts up. You know, hey Prada, maybe we shouldn't have these big lip, <laughs> big lip Prada. Maybe that's just not a good idea, especially given the climate of time. This right. isn't the 80s, you know, where something like this was allowed. This is, this is the concept. And right, right is right, even if no one's doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everybody is. So it's not that it was right then and it's wrong now. It was wrong then, too. That's what people tend to forget. That's why people are like, well, that was 30 years ago, or he did that 10 years ago. Yeah, and it was wrong. <laughs> and it was wrong. And now we realize how wrong it was. And now they have to be held accountable. And accountability will always feel like an attack when you're not ready to accept responsibility for your actions. That's how accountability works. That's why when you catch your boyfriend cheating, he's like, what, why are you going through my phone? Like, why am I going through your phone? How come you're cheating? Let's talk about this. Like, it's because they're not ready to accept responsibility for their action. That's, that's, we see that, uh, we see that in our interpersonal relationships, but in society, we see that with the police. We see that with white people, and we see that currently with America, just not ready to accept responsibility. If simple responsibility, do you know how far, how far an, an awareness would go if everybody just said, we understand what you're going through? You know what? You're correct. You're correct. Just that you're correct, which has never really been done, by the way. No. Whether it's the people who are dying for the Confederate flag or... Uh, the build a wall or whatever the situation is. And I'm, I'm not even bringing up politics. I'm simply bringing right. up principles. I, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm in agreement with you where it's left wing, right wing, same bird. We're in this together. So we need to stop being like, oh, well, all black people need to be Democrats and all white people should be Republican or all white Republicans are this. I don't do, I don't play that game. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. However, when you, I, I do this thing and I'm sure you do it too all the time this thing that's for my peace of mind. I agree to disagree. Have you ever, I agree to disagree. That's one of my favorite things to say. I, like I agree you. to disagree. I and I say it all the time. I say it, I say it when it comes to who's better, Jordan or LeBron. If someone says LeBron, I have to say I agree to disagree. Right. Who's the greatest of all time? I, 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 we have to agree to disagree. What's better, uh, pizza or tacos? We have to agree to disagree. Uh, you know, who, Beyonce or Rihanna, we agree to disagree. But I cannot agree to disagree I cannot agree to disagree if it comes to racism, when it comes to homophobia, when it comes to anti-Semitism, when it comes to sexism. I cannot agree to disagree. I simply disagree. My stance is very simple on those. I simply disagree. There is no agreement or compromise on those issues. It's impossible. Those things are wrong. They are wrong. You don't believe in gay marriage? I understand. Don't marry a gay guy. Problem solved. Look at that. Look at that. I just solved your problem, but buddy. I can do. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because that's where, because they all come from the same place. All that hate comes from the same place. Homophobia. What is homophobia really? Homophobia is our guys, our guys who are afraid that other guys will treat them the same way they treat women. That's what homophobia really is. That's what it is. No, you're right. You got it. That's got where it. it is. Like, oh, he, he's going to look at my ass. Um, let me tell you the truth. Mike, uh, no, he's not. Have you seen? Graham. Have you seen gay guys in West Hollywood? Hello. No one's looking at your ass, buddy. You know what I'm saying? So, That's why we all surprised when Brenda had a baby. Like you've never met a pretty Brenda. Like Brenda, who got Brenda pregnant, right? So the the concept is, you know, shout out to all the pretty Brendas. Yeah, but exactly. Well, you, 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 you respect that. You respect that a Brenda had a baby. You respect, yeah. I'm, I'm impressed. Do I thank you? But th that's the concept. Like sexism is what toxic masculinity. That's that's really it, what it is. Oh, if women have power, then they won't need us. Then become necessary, bro. Right, right, is that right? Exactly. Be a better man. Like use. How are we supposed to hit on women now? Try respect. It's worked this far for me. Like just try respect. You know. And racism, racism is that fear too. Oh, I'm gonna lose. If they, if they get it, then I'm gonna lose it. No, 
That only reason you think that, the only reason you are afraid of words like, or terms like black power is why? Because you think that means white hate, but it doesn't. You only think that because that's what white power means. It means black hate. And that's why you think that. So just don't be bitter, be better. I like that. Well, it's, it's, it's the Pain Olympics. I say it all the time. It's the Pain Olympics. My pain is worse than your pain. No, my pain is worse than your pain. My pain's at a bronze. No, no, my pain's out of silver. No, my pain's at a platinum. Like it's everyone want. I always say it's all, it all, all this hoo ha boils down to people want to be seen and they want to be heard. And uh, my friend Joshua Silverstein, who's a really great um, educator, comedian, beatboxer, who's half Jewish, half black, says this thing about he taught me something on my show once uh, several years ago. He said, you know, he goes, you used to get mad in because you're in LA driving, well, well just period, um, when a homeless person would walk in the middle of the street. Busy street, middle of the day, all of a sudden, it's happened to all of us. This homeless person just all of a sudden just crossed the street slowly, and people start honking, they're screaming. He just continues. And he said he, he learned something. He was like, we probably walk by that homeless person a thousand times a day and never give them a glance. And they feel it. So here's one way to get you to see me. Not even they're doing it consciously. It's almost like, here you go. I went to disrupt your afternoon by crossing the street, not a crosswalk, not a light, not a stop sign, and you're gonna be forced to see me as I am walking across the street. And I, that profoundly changed my outlook. But he says, in LA, the traffic, the 405, the 110, the 137, all those. He's like, James, but we are the traffic because you're sitting in the traffic with everybody else, so you're contributing to the mass, to the traffic. There's other ways you can get around, right? Like, oh yeah. Like, when I started seeing that stuff, when he said that to me, I was like, I get it. That everyone wants to be heard. So yes, their pain is more than your pain, Tehran. I don't care if you're half this or half that, but I'm this and I don't, you know, and I, so I get what people are, you know, and I agree, disagree with a lot of people. I just go, okay, that's your, your perspective, but I get where people are coming from sometimes. They just want to be seen and heard and validated. Those are the three things they want. So they're gonna do what they can to get there. And that means tearing down black folks saying that you guys are whiny and just, and you're just trying to take away our stuff. That's what, and, 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 you know, and, and, and all, the, all the Mexicans are you know, taking our jobs in the fields, the ones they don't wanna work in. Uh, that kind of stuff, it makes me laugh. It's like, but it's more about, it's not even about that really. It's not about any of that, not really. Deep down, it's feeling like I'm not being heard. I'm not being seen, or I won't be seen anymore. Or I, it's, it's like, that's, that's what it is. In my opinion, that's what it is. It's like that's, and so when I hear that from people, I can navigate my, my response because I'm already getting, that's the big picture. And that's what most people are gonna do. We gotta start looking at the big picture and kind of go, okay, where is this all coming from? I get you may be tired. I don't care what that white person thinks, but you know, fuck that white person. But I'm not saying you have to get into your head, but kind of, just, like you said earlier, kind of understand the mentality so you can actually act differently or do different things in response to it, I guess. I uh, like, I like what you said that Josh, Joshua Silverstein, I just followed him on Instagram, by the way, because of what you said. He's the bomb. I love him. He's my, my yeah. best friend. Love him. So the thing is, it's not enough to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. You have to walk with their feet, with their legs, and their knowledge of how to walk, and then see how far you will get as well. We all just want to feel the same things, validated in our opinions, loved, respected, feel important. And that's why a lot of times these riots are the voices of the unheard understandings. That's where they come from. Literally, it's just people who are not being heard want to be heard. And people need to understand, once again, taking it back to our interpersonal level of relationships. When you're in a relationship and your girlfriend or boyfriend is upset about something, you're like, what now? In a dismissive tone. And they start saying stuff that's bothering them. You go, oh. You're crazy. That didn't even happen. This, that's not even how it happened. What's wrong? Oh, you're so crazy. They get upset. That's not resolving. That's not conflict resolution. That is not resolving the issue. And then when they start getting upset, you go, oh, oh no. And then you tell them to relax or calm down. That has never worked. Let me, let me help all the people who are in relationships or want to be in a That never worked. I'm not even in a relationship and I'm letting you know it doesn't work. It's the worst. It's the antithesis. It is the nemesis. It is the opposite of getting someone to calm down and or relax. I'm a professional. I know. So the concept is relax, calm down, whatever it is, that's not where, and that's what people are saying. You're, oh, you're out of your mind. Just relax. Just relax. Just let things be the way they are. You'll be fine. It'll be fine. Well, no. 
And it's interesting to me, and it goes back to the concept of being able to uh, understand the things that affect you. You will very rarely find a, a woman, a white woman, who does not understand sexism. They understand sexism. Even if they don't agree with current, current yeah. trends of feminism, they understand sexism okay, and how it's oppressed to, and holds you back. Mm -hmm. There you go. That same white woman may not understand racism. Well, if you understand sexism, your husband might not understand sexism, and they don't understand sexism or racism. So where do you fall? And where do black women fall in this line? And that's who we need to support even more is black women, because they are at the end of the line. They are at the bottom of the totem pole of who we tend to care about so much, so often. So it's just all part of the same thing. It's like, ugh. I know. I agree. I agree. <sighs> now, my, I could talk to you forever, but the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is, because uh, I don't know if you reveal your ages or not. Do you reveal, you reveal your age or no? I don't want to ask you. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm 33. You're 33. I'm 51. So we're different generations. I want to ask, I always try to ask people who are younger, what does being, for you, being a black man actually mean today? Being a black man today, for me, means it means strength you know one of the things that they and as a person who's been part of the uh protests and, yeah. and it's not so much that i'm a black lives matter organization supporter but i am a movement supporter i've seen the strength in numbers and it's moved me it's moved me, in my opinion, because it's actually made me realize that America's less racist than I thought. Because when you look into the crowd and you see all these allies and accomplices, who, by the way, they always, you know, they want to be thanked and I can't thank you. Like, I don't thank them. Uh, not because I can't thank them enough, but I, I can't thank you for doing the right thing. You know, like, I, I, I appreciate I it. I appreciate it. Right. I appreciate them. But when I see all these different colors of people in the crowd, it makes me realize how less, how less racist America is than I originally thought, even though obviously it's, it's, it's bad. More importantly, I see a lot of black faces in the crowd. And that's what impresses me the most are the black people who are showing up and the black men who are showing up for black women. And that is what gives me a lot of hope. So right now being black, it, it might have in the past, if you'd asked me, it might have been being afraid. It might have been being oppressed. It might have been uh, being discriminated against. It might have meant all those things. But right now and moving forward, barring any Candace Owens interruptions, barring any Terry Crews tweets, oh, to me yeah. it means strength. To me it means strength. Being a black man means being strong, not just for myself, but for black women, for black community, for all communities. And so. That's what it means to me. I like that. For me, I'm just telling people nowadays, as an older black man, I, I feel like um, I got some validation this, this time period. There were a lot, in the beginning, there were a lot of negative say, things said to about my generation, the one before me, that we didn't do enough or whatever. And, and what I'm learning, people, and then what, I think what the younger generation started to learn is that we did what we could, and we did enough to get you where you are today. A hundred percent. I do not know who would ever say that. Those people are, are once they part of the misinformed, uneducated, unaware group. If anyone I, says that. And I, I've heard that. But I'm seeing now I'm seeing more people um, have said to me personally that, you know, they understood the stuff that I went through just so they can not have to go through it. And I think that's and I feel like my job. I've, I've slipped and accepted my even though I'm very young looking and youthful. I have accepted my status as kind of an elder statesman of sorts in some communities, and that's fine with me. I'm part of the village mentality, and I have no problem supporting people like you and others that are my shows and everything. I will always support younger Black people, men and women, and of other genders. I know there's many genders out there. I have trans friends also I support, and people non-binary. Um, I just, for me, I'm having to learn how to think of things in a different way, to be very honest sometimes. I, I didn't grow up with some of these concepts. There were not even options when I was your age, um, that now they are options and I appreciate that more. And, and I think, you know, and being a black man for me today is a state of mind. It is a community. It is, it is, it's the good, the bad, the ugly. It's all of that. And that I just know that my 51 years 
do not go in vain. It's like it's like Definitely I did, not. And not at all. But I'm I'm learning that now. I didn't know that before. I'm learning that I'm learning that now. And I and I appreciate that now. And that I'm happy. The one group of people I don't support is the non-binary people because I spent all that time learning they and he and she. Bro, I could I could have got by in class. Like I've never understood why people care so much what pronoun to use. Like, I know. Why are you so stuck? That's actually a vision of programming. You want to know something very interesting? In Farsi, in the language of Farsi, which is one of the oldest languages yeah. uh, still in use today, it's over 5,000 years old, we in Farsi um, do not have a word for he or she. There is no way to oh. binarily, in, uh, binarily vocalize a person, which is why a lot of, a lot of Iranians in this country will call male, uh, men and women he because it, it takes a second for them to think he, she, all like those things. Okay. You can only say me, you, you all, or they. That's all you can say. You don't, there's no other way. And actually when you're speaking to someone, res, when you're speaking to someone res, respectfully, you refer to them as they, no matter what. Oh. So there's a familiar way to say something. Right. There's a familiar way to say That's something all. like we're, like, how are you, for example? I can say like, uh, hubi, right? Which is just like, we're familiar. You're, you're my friend. Uh, you're not an elder or my parent or something. And it'd be like, hubi, like, yo, are you good? And then if I was speaking to someone who I respect or someone who is an elder or that or a stranger, I would say hubin, which is, are you, are you all well? Or are they well? Yeah. Zay. It's a very similar, it's a very interesting. There is no he or she yeah. because originally in the, uh, in, in the Iranian and in, in Persian empire, there was no differentiation between men and women. Women were warriors, women were generals, women owned yeah. land, women would vote. And so because of that, uh, and it's unfortunate that they've, we've lost that in uh, Iran in the last 40, 50 years, which by the way, has a huge trans community uh, as it offers free trans uh, operations and yet has a, a, a unfortunate homophobic outlook yeah. on gay people. So it's just like contradictions of, of things that are bypasses of, of the past culture mixed with the, the racism and homophobia of the modern culture coming together and colliding. It's so interesting. But yeah, we, we, there's no way to say he or she in Farsi. That's very interesting. Never, never yeah. knew that. See, folks? And I'm like, I just know that everything, people want to want to label you in a box so they feel comfortable. That's 100%. And so, boxes are meant for things and not people. Who cares? If someone who's non-binary asks people what pronoun they prefer to get used. In fact, my, uh, my boy Rami had a very great episode on his show. I love, I love Rami's it. brilliant. It's on Hulu. It is. I love it. He's yes. one of my very good friends, but he's also brilliant. He's a brilliant. His show is brilliant. He has a, a specific episode that, that relates to the pronouns and things in the second season. Uh, and it's when you meet that old world clashing with the new world. Uh, That's the thing. That's the concept is we need to just be aware. It's okay. It's okay to be nice to other people. It's okay. You won't lose anything. You won't lose anything. You really like I, won't. You'd like, be surprised. Well, like I, I saw in the show, as I always say, people should be nice. Nice should be the norm. That's how, that's how I feel about that. Or at least kind. I'm not a big fan of nice. I'm not specifically a nice person, but I am a kind person. I am a kind person. Put down that shell, Tehran. Yeah. I know you're nice. Yeah. You're always nice to me, so you're nice. You're a nice person. You're in there. You're in there somewhere. Because I mean it. It's because yeah. I mean it. I know you do. If I don't. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if I don't, you already know. Yeah, I know. I know. I wouldn't yeah. get on your bad side. Trust me, I wouldn't. Um, but I know, I know I won't. So I don't worry about that at all. Yeah, you um, won't because you're just you. Like, I, that's the thing. I love you. I accept you. I embrace you. I enjoy you. All those things. You, I, I, anybody who thinks you're, you're like an enjoyable person, if they don't know, they might think you're enjoyable. They do not know the extent of your enjoyableness. And that is, I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. Know. You know, I, know. I say these things to you all the time. I know you do. As I'm berating someone else. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. <laughs> like, I'm just like, yo, I'm just, I'm just me. I do not, I'm not, and I'm not ever going to apologize for something I said. If I said it, I'm letting you know I meant it. Let, yeah. Let's say that now. I know. That's why I love you, Tay Rob. I do. Yeah. Now, tell people where they can find you on the social media so they want to follow more of this. 
Well, I'm easy to find. I'm at I am Tehran all across the board. And it's actually uh, interesting. We want, we were speaking about the labels yep, and brands yep, thing. Yep. I always wear my name on my hat, my chains, my shirts, all these things. And at once uh, a group was taking pictures with me. And of course, this one young lady was, you know, that girl. And she wanted to be like, oh, why are you wearing your own name? You're so vain. You're so cocky. Blah. And it's like, and I, I was like, you do real. you're wearing a, Tommy Hill figure shirt, you realize you're wearing a person's name. Like, that's literally his full name. That's not even like his half name. No, that's exactly. Name. Louis Vuitton is someone's name. Armani is someone's name. Uh, Prada is someone's name. I'm simply my own fan, my own favorite team, my own, right. I wear my own thing and it's okay. Like, it doesn't take away from what you think is your brand. Yeah. So, so that's the concept. I am Tehran. My name is Tehran, like the capital of Iran. I A M T E H R A N. If you don't know how to spell it, just watch Fox News. I'm sure they'll bring me up at some point during the day on how atrocious I am in the world today. So oh my God, I love it. And I'll put it in the I'll put it in this description, of course. <laughs> you can follow it there. And you can follow me. We're all James Law Jr. Just sold at James Law Jr. and all social media platforms. I'm also JLJ Media. I have 30 shows out right now. People who are coming to have, I have audio soap operas and reality shows, all kinds of things going on. I have a great collaborative nature in my, on my network right now. So go ahead and check those out across the board. Every streaming service and YouTube, JLJ Media, go ahead and watch all those. Um, now also out there, please be careful, stay as safe as you can, lift each other up, share knowledge and pay it forward.